Okay, so uh, shall we quickly go to the final project? Is that uh, make sense? I hear some yes things. Uh, let's see here, final assignment, documents, I need to make sure that I, final project explanation, so I cannot open this for you, because then, okay. So I hope that you like the final project, it's, it's not easy, and why is it not easy, because nowadays, there is so many codes available on the internet that if I give you a very common problem and I ask you to solve that problem, you just Google and you have a code that can solve that problem. Yeah, so we need to come up with something that is nice, that connects to the material in the book, that is somehow related to engineering in some sense, that, that has an engineering design context and and it's not already available on the internet, so bear with us. So it takes some time sometimes to come up with an, a reasonable final project, okay? But think about this one here. So essentially, we have a map here that's of 100 by 100. This map was created, and we already talked about this, based on 10 observations. So someone went out there and somehow observed the soil opened up the soil and you have all kind of uh, equipment for that and he identified at each at 10 different locations 10 different soil types and this is useful for engineering construction because if you have a soil that is poorly consolidated that means you need a different design than with a soil that has better uh, consolidation so that, that's somehow important so he came up with 10 original measurement locations this is x this is y yeah and based on that he made a map because he's like okay now i have 10 point observations i have observed the soil at 10 different x y locations and these are 10 different results 10 different soils i now like to give the engineers of the area a map because based on a simple point observation they don't know if they go somewhere else but the likely soil is over there so he used nearest neighbor interpolation so now we have an interpolation problem connects to chapter 10, that's no longer one dimensional, but it's now two dimensional, we have X and Y, okay? So, a MATLAB has built-in functions that can do nearest neighbor interpolation for you, okay? And one of them is crit data, the other one is interp2, but one of them is crit data, so essentially what we have now is the question is, is can you, based on this map that you have, so for each cell you know what soil type it is, can you tell us what the original location was of the measurements? And that this is possible, let's just go over the first step so that, 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 that we can show you how you do this actually. So this is a while ago, so bear with me help crit data, let's, let's see, so um, yeah, so let's create some random values of x between 0 and 100 and do the same for y, okay, so I just create 10, ren 10, 1 is 10 observations, so now I have x and y, so I have, and now I can create the soil type c is 1 through 10, yeah, so now I have X, Y, and C, okay? So these are my X locations, these are my Y locations, and this is the associated soil type, which is 1 through 10. And now we can actually create a map, and I think we do that with mesh grid, and this also has come back in, in our exercises, I think, in the earlier chapters, where we interpolate on a map that is one, uh, what, which is 100 by 100, yeah? We know that that's the case, yeah? This is 100 by 100, yeah, with step size 1. Now we execute crit data, and that goes, I think, as follows, x, y, c, x, x, y, y. And now with p color, we can actually look at the actual map. Oh. So, um, what's the ci? 
Oh yeah, wait, yeah, of course. We need to inc indicate that this is nearest neighbor, yeah? Something like that. Yeah, here. This is now the map that corresponds to these x, these 10 original observations of x and y, because it's two-dimensional, yeah? Each observation has an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate, and we have 10 soil types. So based on these values for x and y, so these 10 observations, so I went out there, someone went out there and randomly just located on the map 10 different locations where he was saying, okay, I'm going to estimate the soil type over here. These are the locations, and then he used these locations. He determined that these are, have soil types 1 through 10, and then he said, you know what, now I'm going to do nearest neighbor inter, uh, interpolation, and now I'm going to make a nice map of that. And it looks like this. Okay? So what you see is we have something that's 100 by 100, so that's good. So we essentially solved the problem, but our map looks completely different than the map that I have over here, the original map. So now the idea is, can you change the values of x and y in such a way that after you do this interpolation that you have back the original map here? Yeah, that's the, oh. So, why is this always so difficult? Something like this. Yeah, they, 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 these two maps, that they look alike. You see here that they're not really looking alike. They're completely different. And that is because the X and Y values that we just randomly created are not the same that we used to create this map. Okay, so the question now is, so now you know which functions to use, and that's also in the document, documentation associated with the final project that I sent. I gave these hints. It's in there. Um, now what we're left with is an algorithm, an iterative approach, in which we can improve the x and y locations so that we get closer to the map that we have in the final project, this map. So somehow we like to have a computer algorithm that changes the x and y values so that we get, ultimately we get exactly this. And I gave a hint and I said have a look at simulated annealing. That's a very simple algorithm that can help you solve this problem. And based on your experience in MATLAB coding, you should be able to code that algorithm, okay? And there were some groups that already successfully, they showed me some uh, interesting results that, that looked already pretty close to the final map. Okay? So, how does this simulated annealing work? Now, imagine... I have my map here, yeah? My CI values here. This is my map. I also have, and now I need to go to the right directory here. Here. Load map.txt. What I can do is that the error is equal to map minus ci. So the size of the error is 100 by 100. Yeah? Map was the original map. So if I do p color map, I have back what I have plotted in the PDF file here, yeah? And CI is what we, what we are getting. So we have an error for each location. Ideally, each location, the difference is zero. So now what we can do is we can simply say, we can do different things. One of them is we can quantify the error. What we can do is we simply say, you know, sum, sum error unequal is unequal to unequal is zero. So what I did here is I looked at all the cells of error. Error is 100 by 100. And I said, 
which of those cells are unequal to zero? Because if they're zero, that means that my map in the PDF file is identical, the soil type there is identical to the soil type that you predict. That's what you want. You want at all locations to have the same soil type. At all 10,000 locations, 100 by 100, you want your map to be the same as the map that was provided in map.txt and plotted in the PDF file. So what we calculate here is I said, tell me all the locations where error is unequal to zero, like, and that looks like this, for those that is, un yeah, that looks like this. So that's a map again of 100 by 100, and you see that only at very few locations here, it's similar, yeah? You see here a bunch of locations where it's similar, where it's zero. So if I now take the sum of this, then I take the sum over each column, okay? So I need to take another sum, because I have something that's two-dimensional. When I take the sum, remember, I'm going to take the sum over each column. Yeah, and now I need to take the sum of all, the, of all these values. So that's why I have a double sum. So that means that at 9703 location is the map that we created randomly different than the map that we're looking for. Now, okay, so we can write a simple script. So edit... Um, Edit test.m, yeah? Oh no, that's not what we want. Apparently that's an existing script. Edit uh, final project.m, doesn't exist, so this script runs final project, and we start with some axis random, we know it's somewhere 10 comma 1, y is 100 times rand. So rand is between 0 and 1. So if I multiply that with 100, I get a value between 0 and 100. Okay, then c is 1 through 10 because I have 10 soil types. Yeah, now what I do, uh, create map. So what we do is ci is, uh, so that's what we do here, but we first need to do, do mesh grid here. So we do xx, because we have something that's 100 by 100. And now we go into a for loop. 4j for is 1 through like 1,000 or so. Now uh, uh, we calculate um, or calculate error, okay? So error is sum, error is ci minus map, and then uh, dot error is dot, calculate dot error. And so what we also need to load original map, load map.txt, okay, here we are. Now create loop. So what we do is, as we know the total error now, yeah? So now what we do is somehow we need to perturb the x and y values, because we cannot use f0 for this, because we have 10 x values and we have 10 y values, which are 20 values that we're trying to find. So f0 only works with one x value. So what you can do is you can just write a code that says, you know what, create new x values. And so what I can do is I can say like x is x plus, um, yeah, uh, this multivariate random x and then uh, what I can do is, uh, that's easiest for you with the identity matrix scaled with some value. So I create identity matrix, i is i10, and then I multiply that with 5, x new, 
So I create new x values, then I do the same, same with y values. y new is multivariate normal random, and then the old y values with 5 times y. Okay? So, um, yeah. So the function multivariate normal random is a multivariate normal distribution. We know what that is, yeah? We know what the normal distribution is, yeah? And this multivariate normal is just one that is in two or more dimensions. And that is because x is in, has 10 values. So that's why I specify our original x value. So what we now do is after the new x and y is create new map. Yeah? So that's what we do with grid data here. So essentially we copy all this. CI new is x new, y new. And then calculate error, error, that, and we don't need to know that one, we only need to know the dot error, new, and now decide whether to accept new x and y values or not. So if dot error new smaller than dot error, x is x new and y is y new. End. End. Okay, so I essentially did your final project, so everyone has an A now. <laughs> but no, this is just an initial starting point, okay? You can do this better, but... So what am I doing over here? No one knows, but I start with some initial x and y values, okay? that were randomly created, and I create them randomly, and that is not smart, okay? This is not smart. I told you, look carefully at each soil type here, yeah? Look carefully at each soil type here, because if you look at this map, then you know almost that one, the value of one must be something of 40, 55 or so. Are you following me? And now I create it randomly between 0, 100, 0, and 100. So I might create one over here or a nonsense. So if you start with a good starting value, yeah, that already makes a big difference because then your map already looks close to the map that is created here. But I, I just do it randomly, okay? Here what I, then I, based on those x and y values, I specify the associated soil type, I load the original map, I do the mesh grid so that I can, can interpolate on a map for 100 by 100, then I do grid data, which is the nearest neighbor inter, inter, uh, interpolation. I have my x and y values that I randomly created, the associated c value, and then I interpolate on a map that's 100 by 100. And I say, do this using nearest neighbor implement, uh, interpolation. Then I calculate the error, and I take the total error. Now, before I then start a loop, I, st I specify that I is an identity matrix that, oh, that looks like this. Yeah, remember that? So if I now create a number with help multivariate normal random, is random factors from a multivariate normal distribution where R is multivariate normal, mu is the current values of X that you have, and sigma is a covariance matrix. And that I just created using a, as an identity matrix. So I assumed that there is no covariance because all the off-diagonal elements are zero, so I just created some covariance matrix, okay? And what I did here is I multiplied it by 5. And that, that is something that if you multiply it with 2 or 3 or 10, it might be way more efficient. So what happens now is um, where we say x, O, oh, x, y. I need to figure out, so uh, 
Oh, print accepted this or we can just say we can print J here that's better here okay now let's see if this works no one knows so you see here that Oh, let's see here. Delta error new. Oh yeah, CE new. This needs to be the new map, not the old map. So you see that it's going down. You see that? So I can actually plot that here. Uh, and store store error value so we call that e for some reason J uh, e counter comma one is dot error oh here dot error is dot error new okay that's another thing you need to do okay so now and i will explain this again in a second um, and then we'll update counter, update counter, counter is counter plus one. And we initially say that counter is two, counter is two, and uh, E1 is dot error. And then actually what I should do is one to two is zero, dot error so that we know iteration versus the error so here we have one through two is j and then dot error let's see if this works okay final project so now we have e so plot e for e Oh, so what do we see here? You see what happened here? You see here, we started out with a map that had like almost on 9,000 locations. The map that we randomly created was different than the map that uh, uh, the original map. And you see over iteration number that the number of the, that the differences go down back to 7,000. And you still see that it's improving, but slowly, okay? You, on the contrary, I start out with 9,000 different locations because I randomly select the initial X and Y values. If you select your initial X and Y value based on the information from the true map, yeah, so you say, I know that my X1 is like probably around 40 and Y1 is 50, and I know that X2 is like 30 and Y2 80, now et cetera, you do that for all of them, then you will see that your initial map will not be different at 9,000 locations that my map was. You'll see that it probably will be different at 2,000 locations or so, yeah? And then you just write an algorithm that updates these X and Y values using, this is what they call a stochastic method where you create, you have your current x value and you just use a certain perturbation and you, you draw this using a multivariate normal distribution or any other distribution. So you just adjust the x values randomly with some distribution. You do the same with the y values and then based on the new X values and Y values that you randomly created, you create a new map, which is called CI underscore new. Then based on that new map, you calculate the error of the new map with 
the original map and then you calculate the total error new which is the sum of the sum of those errors that are unequal to zero and then you have a simple rule that says if my new the error of my new map is smaller than the error that I currently have then what I do is I simply say that my new map the x values of my map are the new x values the new y values are the new y values that I created and the new error that I have is the new error that I just computed. So that means that x and y are improved over time because you only accept when it's better. And what I did here is I stored in a variable e, I stored if this happens, if you do accept, I stored the actual iteration counter j and the associated error so that I can plot later a function and I think I requested that from you in the final project something like this where this is iteration number and we did like 900 or so, I don't know how many we did, or a we did a thousand but that means that in the the last number that I accepted was 900. From 900 to 1000 I didn't accept anything anymore, which means that 900 is my last value. And the total error, so you see the total error, you see it decline, so you see that it goes rapidly down with 2000 in the first 50 or 100 iterations, so you already improved the map in the first 100 iterations considerably. So but, but my initial value was really bad, so let, let's use 10 times this, okay? And I plot this again. Now I'm getting something like this. So I started again around 9000 and now I end up at 6500. So you see that it gets harder and harder to improve, yeah? later on that initially it improves a lot but it gets harder and this is now part of the final project how can you still resolve this that you do find the optimum location first of all you should start with a better estimate than I do I start with a random estimate for each measurement which doesn't make sense okay so you your total error will be much smaller. Your initial total error will maybe be 2000 or so, yeah? And then you have to update these x and y values using a script that I just wrote. But do it in an intelligent way because look at simulated annealing as a method of doing that. And another hint that I will make, look at something that's called the Metropolis algorithm. Okay, which is closely related to simulated annealing. And that will be able to solve this problem for you. Okay? So essentially, this is an iterative solver. So you start out with some values of x and y, and you just improve them over time by comparing the current error with the new error. If the new error is smaller than what you currently have, you accept your new map and your new map becomes the reference. Does this make sense? Any questions? Oh, people like to see the script, yeah? Instead of this function. And I only did a thousand, yeah? You can go way beyond this. And there's, there's ways to do this better, okay? But this essentially, I gave away 70% of the final project, 75%, okay? Now the question is, what we will do, we will compare your X and Y values against the ones that we know are the truth. So we can compute for each group the total distance to the true result, yeah? And based on that we can make a list of groups that did well and groups that have that didn't do as well. At the same time, we will also take into consideration how well you did in writing the final report. Because if you do get the exact map, 
and you write a very lousy final report, then that still can affect your grade, okay? So you need to get the final result right, ideally, and also write a reasonable final project report. That's maximum three pages, okay? So I don't want that discusses the code that you wrote and shows some graphs that I asked for in the PDF. And one of them is what I just showed here, where you show the error, how that reduces as function of time. So in the final project PDF, I talk about the sum of squared error. That's another measure that you can use, okay? Here what I do, I look at the number of dissimilar cells. This. This objective is just the number of dissimilar cells. Another objective that you could use is you have the error, yeah? You could take, you could square the error and then take the sum of the sum, and now what we have is the sum of squared error. So that's another objective you could use. So one of the things is you could look at the number of dissimilar cells between the original map and the map that you created. And another objective is where you could say, you know what, we just square each error, the, the, so each cell, that, that difference, I square that, and I take the sum of over all the columns and then of the individual columns. Yeah? So we, this is much larger, but maybe that works better. I don't know. That, so the error in squared, is that, um, is that based off the ones in the zero map or is that based off the z values that each position has? Um, so the error here, this error is just the difference between the simulated map and the observed map, their C values. Okay, so it's, it would be weighted um, in terms of what your Z value is. So if you, if you had the, the, the 10 um, numerical value for the soil over the two, it would be a greater difference. In the yes, area. so this, let's say that you have a difference between five and four, and you have a difference between 10 and 1. So 10 and 1 would count as 9 difference error, and that squared is 81, whereas 5 and 4 counts as 1, and 1 squared is 1. So even though both are not similar, one somehow is penalized much heavier than the other one. And that's the disadvantage of this measure. But you could try different measures, because different measures might be, it might be easier to find the optimum for one measure than it is for another measure. This, the, and, and, and this is an entire new course, okay? That's a whole course in optimization. Depending on the measure that you take, so you can design a measure for which it's easy, relatively easy that you see a continuous improvement till the final solution. Whereas another measure, it's much harder to find the optimum. Think about the navigation system in your car. If you have a really bad navigation system, it's hard to find the place where you have to go to. Whereas if you have a really good navigation system, it's much easier. That's the same as the objective function that you're using. Think about that as the navigation, the quality of the navigation system. So the number of dissimilar cells could be a useful measure that doesn't penalize differences in c-values, but just says, you know, if my simulated map and my original map differ, then that just counts as one and not as the difference in the actual soil type. Other questions? Is this more or less clear, the final project? So believe it or not, but there's a lot of countries that do not share their data. So they share maps in publications. So they show these really nice maps in publications. And then if you ask them, hey, can you give me your original data? They say, no, we're not allowed to share this data. So the point here is, that you now know enough of computer programming that when you see a picture like this, that you can actually derive the original location of the samples. Because in some situations, that could be very valuable. 
Yeah. Um, the interpolation that's going on here, could you kind of like spatially kind of talk about how it's how it's sorting these values? So you have a 10 values and then it. So how the interpolation works? It's in, I guess in a sense, because it's this, this two dimensional version of it. Yeah, yeah, okay. So for each of the values that are, let's say, in five, yeah? Each of the cells that have a color that's associated with five, yeah? Soil type five. That means that the Euclidean distance of each cell that is within five is closer to the observation of five, the X and Y location of five, than, for instance, any other value in three, one, four, eight, whatever. So in other words, each, each similar soil type, so each value that's within here, yeah, in within this wonderful green color, yeah, um, the Euclidean distance, which is the difference in x squared and the difference in y squared, yeah, that's a Euclidean distance, you can look at Wikipedia. The distance of this to the value of 5, the, the observation, is closer than the distance from this to where the location of 3 is. Does that make sense? Now, it, uh, what it says, it's nearest neighbor. So the underlying assumption is that if I have, let's make it really easy, okay? Let's say I have this chair, yeah? And that chair is, uh, we're not going to be very creative, okay? It's going to be, the chair's going to be over here, okay? And what I did is, I have an observation over here. This is one observation. And the other table is another observation, yeah? Okay. So now, this is soil type 1. That is soil type 2, yeah? I have two point observations. Yeah, this is a table, so it's not really a point, but imagine it's a point observation, yeah? At one location. So this is soil type 2. That is soil type 1. And now I s tell... MATLAB, you know what, based on those two observations, I actually, in this case it's 10, I actually want to create a map of 100 by 100 because for someone that is a developer, it's not really useful to only have 10 point observations because he's going to wonder, okay, you know what, if I'm over here, what is my soil type then? Or if I'm there or there or there or there. So he wants a map. So the way that works is that this point, each point, calculates the Euclidean distance between this location and this location, yeah? And the Euclidean distance between the same location and this other measurement, yeah? Now, what's going to figure out that the Euclidean distance between this and this is smaller than the Euclidean distance between that and that? This is going to be soil type 1. If we move it here, let's move it a little bit here. This is still soil type 1. Then if we move it here, it becomes 2. So the boundary of 2 is probably going to be somewhere here in the middle. Yeah, because that's all closer to there than it is to over here. And here we have 10 of those values. So each cell if it's the same color, that means that the distance of this cell to the, to the measurement 5 is the closest distance, is closer than it is to 3, 10, 7, what is that? 6, 1, 2. That's essentially how it works. And that's why we use nearest neighbor implementation. And why do we use nearest neighbor? Because if you don't use nearest neighbor, what it's actually going to do, it's going to actually average things out. 
Like, you can imagine that if I have a 5 here and I have a 3 here, I have two point observations, that if you do it other type of interpolation, like linear interpolation, that's going to end up with a 4 over here. Yeah, it's in between, yeah? That's not how nearest neighbor implementation works. It assumes that all the values are the same as where I have my point observation if they are within the smallest Euclidean distance from that point observation. Then they're all considered to be the same. That's the, um, and check Wikipedia. It, it explains it very nicely there. And that's why when we do implementation, the implementation we specify in our code nearest neighbor as the method, because you can use this grid data method with different interpolation techniques. So, any other uh, question? Everyone asleep? No, that's good. So, so uh, yeah, then we, um, what I showed you also in the, uh, in the, X, uh, what is it, in the Excel spreadsheet, an idea of the grading we used last year, yeah? And I was positively surprised about the average grades. Like, if I look at the numbers of the different sessions, yeah, then it looks as if by far most students should easily pass. If you do not mess up your exam three, and you do well on your final project, because you've seen that a lot of students already have a score of 45, 50, yeah? So if you do well on your final project, that should be at least seven, eight points there. If you fill out the final evaluation 95%, add two points to it, that's 10 points, then you're already at 60, and then you still have your final exam added to it. So, about curving, as you've seen, is that there is a few students that have a score close to 70. Which means, I think the highest score is 69 something. Uh, uh, I quickly talked to uh, one, of my, uh, one of the TAs. Um, so, um, if you do add the two points extra to that, and assuming that this student will get the perfect score for everything else, then this student will get a score above 100, yeah? And that means that I cannot curve anymore then, and then there's still different ways of curving, but as it looks now, now curving is not really needed, and um, yeah, there's always students that will fail, but the number I expect not to be many. So, I was happy to see the overall results, also knowing that we, yeah, that this is not an easy class. I understand very well that we discuss a lot of material in a short time, okay? I'm very well aware of that. And we've talked, I've talked with other faculty many times. I said I'd rather discuss a smaller amount of material in a shorter, and that I have more time. But there are certain requirements of the curriculum that we have. So I need to cover this. So based on this, we're gonna have two courses in the future. So this fall, I will teach this class to first year students. So that means that we will only go up to maybe chapter six, maybe chapter seven, yeah? And then the second year course is gonna be chapter seven to chapter 12. And of course, reviewing the earlier material. So that means we have way more time. So please understand that sometimes this class was designed by someone else. You take over a class that we also realize that this is a lot of material. So that's why we try to tell you very clearly in the scripts that I send out what is important and what is not important and not leave you just with a book of 800 pages and tell you just figure it out, yeah? What we discuss in the scripts is, is important and particularly if I highlight it also 
by saying things in the class, like the last three chapters, what's really important are the built-in functions. You should really know how to work with them and how to set up these problems. If you're good at that, you should do well on the last exam. And again, you should know a Lagrange interpolator, monomial, but we just showed monomial essentially is, you can use that with polyfit or a van der Monde matrix solver. Okay? And Lagrange is essentially a linear interpolator. So you can do that with interp1. But pay attention to the number of bases or the number of support points you use. So, um, so be gentle to us, please. Otherwise, we're fired, yeah? Which is uh, no big deal, but uh, then you do something else in life, but uh, oh well. But anyway, is there any more questions? So again, fill out that final evaluation because you think one or two points is no difference, but every year I have five or 10 students that write me because they got a 64.98, and with the 65, they would have got like a higher grade. And they say, yeah, but you know, I did better on exam three, and the first week this happened, the second week that, and this and this, but I, I need to be strict. Because if I start giving, you know, we're already giving credit 15 points for lab attendance. I try to um, give you more points by filling out the final evaluation. So fill that out because last year, believe it or not, there were still at the end, we had uh, 40 more students, but there were still like 20 students or so that did not fill out the final evaluation. After repeated requests, I said, this is in your favor, yeah? And because I kept telling them every day an update, okay, now we have so many students filling it out. Now we have so many. Now I said, we still need three. Who, who is going to sacrifice his or her life to fill this out for extra points? But still, it didn't work. So please fill it out. And I know that you guys probably all will, but maybe some of the people, so it's recorded. Luis, uh, make sure it's on there. And then five times, yeah? Because... Um, we also try to be helpful. So, okay, it, it's 12, so if you have any question or we're basically uh, done. So please also thank the TAs, okay? The TAs, they also put a lot of effort into this class. Please understand that, okay? They do much more than I do. I just show up, I just do the easy work and make the exams and the quizzes, but they do the hard work, okay? So please thank them. It's their doing. For me, it's just uh, showing up. Maya, yeah, have a good luck with your exam and good luck with the final project. And uh, Maya, yeah, you know where to find us. And you know your scores. You know the score, uh, the grading table that we mo my, most likely are going to use. So you know what the results, what grades you should be getting for your final project and your final exam to pass or what what grade you will be ending up with okay and uh, have a nice weekend enjoy the weekend